Dr. Ava Nekvi-Spado is going to be presenting uh, the role of binocular visual input in the control of pendulum movements, a developmental perspective, and she is traveling from the University of Waterloo. So thank you for coming. Good morning. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the So I, the question that I'm interested in is, what is the advantage of having two eyes for guiding movement? So vision obviously provides very important input for guiding our ultimate movements, for reaching, when we want to reach for a cup of coffee, for using tools when kids are learning to manipulate things and uh, making troubles and making stops. So by not being vision, But about 5 to 6% of children do not have good binocular vision. So the end of my research is to understand, first of all, what is the role of this input in the development of normal motor control in children? And also, what is the effect of disrupting this input on the development of motor skill? So binocular vision can provide uh, advantages during movement planning and during, during movement executing. There are two mechanisms that can be responsible for this. One is binocular summation. So because we have two independent inputs, these can be summated and this can improve the signal to noise ratio. So this can be important during movement planning when the object's properties have to be detected and discriminated. So objects, size, orientation, um, height, weight, such things. The other mechanism is binocular disparity. So we have two eyes, and the two eyes provide a slightly different perspective. Okay, this is called binocular disparity, and this is the basis of stereopsis. So stereopsis is the ability to see in depth by combining visual inputs, and it provides us important input for relative depth, so relative uh, differences in, in depth between objects. But importantly, binocular vision is not something that's innate. Children are born, and their vision is 40 times worse in terms of acuity and they have no functional binocular vision. So this is what is illustrated here on this graph. We have the development of, of vision across ages, and stereopsis emerges about two months from birth, and about six months after birth, virtually all normally developing infants have stereopsis, okay? But this continues to develop. It doesn't stop at six months. It continues to develop into early teenage years. The other aspect of binocular vision is virgins. This is the motor component. So virgins eye movements allow us to, to look at objects that are at different depths. And of course, this also matures over time. And in fact, it's the slowest eye movement to, to mature. And this is shown in this graph here. So what is plotted here is the number of virgins eye movements that people can make in one minute interval across ages. And adulthood levels are not reached so about 12 or 14 years of age. So the bottom line is that binocular visual functions mature slowly over the first decade of life and into the second decade of life. But once binocular vision develops, it does provide important advantages for guiding, reaching, and grasping movements. So in adults who develop good binocular vision, they have better scaling of grip aperture in comparison to monocular viewing, for example. Shorter deceleration phases during reaching. So, may, so binocular vision provides uh, some uh, important advantages for online control or building the approach phase when we are getting closer to the, uh, to the, to the targets that we want to pick up. And also, uh, higher peak velocities have been reported, but this is only true for more complex tasks when there, is, there are more phases in, in the workspace than one. So binocular vision develops slowly, and visual motor control also develops slowly. And the objective of my research is to really understand how do we get from this type of control, where there's lots of variability, to this type of control. Does binocular vision 
provide important input for guiding this sort of uh, development. So to approach this, I use a behavioral kinematic approach um, uh, methods, and we use an eye tracker to, to uh, record eye movements. It's a binocular video-based eye tracker, and ocular movements are recorded with the off-the-track motion capture system. And in this particular um, study that I'm going to tell you about, we had nine visually normal children participating. They were between seven and nine years old. And there were seven visually normal adults who also participated. So what I'm sure going to show you next is the overview of the experimental protocol. So this is sort of a, a top-down view. So the participant is seated in front of a workspace. And they're, they're fixating on a fixation. And their head is in a standardized position. And then there are three objects that are placed in the workspace. These are three, uh, these are three-dimensional objects, real objects, cylinders that, that differ uh, in the diameter. And they are placed at two different distances. So this is one of the things when we are manipulating the distance in depth. Participants are asked to um, first discriminate the size of a circle that is shown at fixation. Okay, so the the diameter of this circle corresponds to the diameter of one of the cylinders. So they have to look here, discriminate this, um, this target in order to pick up the right cylinder. So their task is to pick up the right cylinder from this workspace and to lift it up and put it onto this target. So this is like a puzzle task where uh, participants have to discriminate first the aperture or the target as fixation and then pick the correct one and fit it onto that space. So this task is done in two viewing conditions, binocularly and monocularly with the wide eye. So first I'm going to show you um, some of the patterns of eye movements that we, that we find in adults. So what you're seeing here, it's cut off a little bit here, but this is velocity plotted over time for two single trials uh, from a typical subject, for example. And what you're seeing here is the right eye that is plotted, uh, that is red, and the left eye is blue. So these data are what I would have expected in, in this past performance. So what we are seeing here is the subject looking from fixation, which is here, and making a divergent eye movement to the cylinder, okay, that is right here, and then making a saccadic eye movement to another target. So this is not the target that uh, matches this size, they will make another saccade. Okay, and then they might go back to, uh, to this place because they picked up that cylinder and now they have to carry it and play, place it precisely into that circle. So this is the typical behavior that we see in our adults. Children uh, show a, 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 very, a very different eye movement pattern. Okay, so these are three trials from different um, from different um, participants, and we do we do not see uh, these symmetrical convergence eye movements in the children. Okay, so what they are showing is a version convergence um, type of eye movement. So a saccade and a convergence eye movement that are combined. That's why we see this uh, difference in, in amplitude of the eye movements. So, there's, so that's one of our, our main findings, that uh, children's, children's eye movements are very different. The other finding that you see here is that there is uh, a difference in uh, the, the time between when the eye movement is initiated. So this is the latency that is very delayed in the children. And you can see here that um, all of this is cut off. The delays are not as long in the, uh, in the adult. So they can discriminate better the target and then pick it up. So this delay is illustrated here in the means as well. This is eye movement latency for binocular viewing and monocular viewing. Adults are shown in the red. And there is no difference between binocular and monocular viewing. But uh, for children, we do find a difference. Then when children have binocular vision available, their uh, responses are quicker. So they are better able to maybe extract the relevant information from the display in order to, uh, and then to make the eye movement into the workspace to pick up the right uh, correct cylinder. 
So next we looked at by hand temporal coordination. And uh, that has been, this has been studied extensively, and we know that eye movements precede uh, reaching movements, usually. Uh, and there are advantages for that. So it's not just the inertia, because the eye has lower inertia, so the eye can go to the target first. The, when the eye goes to the target, the brain gets important information to guide the subsequent reaching movement. So when the eye is uh, going to the target, there is high resolution visual feedback that is then available. And also, uh, the system has access to the inference copy and the uh, sensory consequences of that movement, which can be used to update and modify the uh, motor command for reaching. So we looked at this initially by plotting the difference between eye and hand movement initiation. Okay, so zero would be when uh, these two movements are initiated at the same time. And negative values means that uh, the hand movement was initiated prior to the eye movement. The positive values mean the normal uh, expected uh, responses where the hand movement is initiated after the eye movement. So it is cut off here, but this is a cumulative distribution function. So this is uh, the key actually, so this would be the median. And we find that in adults, the mean and the median are uh, very similar. And it's about 400 milliseconds before the hand is in, movement is initiated after the saccade, um, after the eyes go to the target. And we do not find any differences between binocular and monocular viewing conditions. So basically adults are pretty efficient at extracting information from the display, even during monocular uh, visual conditions. In children, we do see uh, a shift. So um, what we do see here is that during monocular viewing, the, the, shift, uh, the curves are shifted to, the, the monocular curve is shifted to the left. So that means that there is a smaller difference uh, between the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the viewing, in the latency between eye and hand movement initiation. And that is because the saccades are delayed in the monocular viewing condition. Because I'm going to show you in the next graph the actual uh, initiation of the reaching movement, which is plotted here, okay, is not different between binocular and monocular viewing conditions. So this is for the adults, again, in the red bars, and also uh, for the children. So not, not significant, uh, not significant difference. And the uh, movement time for these responses, we also found no significant differences uh, between binocular and monocular viewing. Obviously, the children are to take longer to process information and also to execute their movement to actually reach the target. And um, our preliminary analysis of kinematic data just looked at the uh, peak velocity. So the peak velocity is a variable that uh, can tell us uh, about uh, movement planning because it scales with the uh, target's distance in depth. So what is plotted here is data for binocular viewing in the near viewing condition for children and for adults and, and far viewing condition right here. So we see that both children and adults scale in their peak velocity. So the system can use binocular information to register accurate depth information for um, planning these motor responses. That's binocular viewing. And in the, during monocular viewing, we find that adults can still scale this, right? There's still the scaling of, of, um, of depth and peak velocity. Um, but children are much less effective. They have to show reduced scaling during monocular viewing. So uh, binocular vision provides them with important information for uh, planning the movement and knowing where the target is in depth. Okay, so uh, just a couple of conclusions. Um, so this is very preliminary data. Uh, but what we, and this is, I think this is the first study that, has, that is looking at eye movements in this, uh, in this population during a more complex task that has been used previously. So previous studies have examined uh, binocular monocular um, visual information during reaching in children, but they used simple tasks, one target, usually positioned at midline, and eye movements were not recorded. But uh, eye movements can provide us with a lot more insight into how this behavior is organized. So in particular, um, in the study, we're finding age-related changes um, in the pattern of eye movements and also the tempo of eye-hand coordination. And um, this is the beginning of this research, so 
we have to recruit a lot more subjects of different ages to really um, understand the trajectory of the development and the relationship between the development of binocular vision and uh, these uh, prehension movements. And of course, the key to this is also testing children with abnormal binocular vision. And thank you. Thank you. 